is good morning, Boo Boo Bodacious. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're doing well, man. Good morning, Bitcoiners. Good morning, Greg. Good morning, Greg. Joseph, coffee indeed. Indeed, the coffee. B for victory. How you doing? How you doing? How do you do, fellow Bitcoiners, says Louis. I do well. I do Bitcoin and I do well. David, good morning, Bitcoin. Morning, Bitcoiners, bud. Morning, David. Let's see. Uh, there. Oh, we got the uh, we got a restreamer in here. That's fine. We like that. All right. We like it. Hello, 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 everyone. So let's just do a quick verification. The sun's up. <laughs> We're good. And I checked. Bitcoin's running, guys. It's a great morning. Let's have a coffee and talk about what's new. As you know. We like to start every morning with the fakest news we can find. We call it Moscow time. Moscow time. Well, you know, a lot of uh, pride celebrations this month. And, you know, this show is very LGBTQ plus uh, positive, right? So happy pride to everyone who celebrates that. Uh, but they're not so happy with a town in M Michigan. So a town in Michigan Um now, there's a little thing about this town, a lot of Muslim people there, and they're not into the pride flags, it turns out, and the news had to talk about it. So they say, a sense of betrayal, liberal dismay, as Muslim-led U.S. city bans pride flags. Many liberals celebrated when Hamtramp, Hamtramp, Michigan elected a Muslim-majority council in 2015, but a vote to exclude, exclude LGBTQ plus flags from city property has soured relations. So CNN also mentions as, community across, as communities across the United States celebrate June as Pride Month, a city near Detroit, Michigan, has voted to permanently ban the display of Pride flags. And uh, some people did have the time to go back and look. Now, normally we don't put punchlines in any of our Moscow Time stuff, but, you know, people had to compare what CNN said about Hamtramp, Hamtramp, uh, just a few years ago. So it turns out they called it a palim, palimpsest, a palimpsest, where new immigrants have laid layers of culture and society on top of what was already there. You can enjoy a sizzling Yemeni fowl, a spicy bean stew, a flatbread for breakfast, and still find a kielbasa or pierogi for lunch. And Hamtramka is now back on the rise. One of the fastest growing cities in Michigan. Census figures show the new immigrants are fixing up dilapidated houses, opening stores and restaurants, putting down roots. And what could be more American than diving into local politics? So that's what they said a couple years ago. Now, they had a new email, a new note today in CNN saying they're a threat to the community. And so it's no longer good. Uh, the same thing happened in... Canada, and it turns out that the um, uh, a group says the using religion in an attempt to shield themselves from criticism, and the new group is called the YYC Muslims, and it's not indicative of the Muslim community in Calgary. Uh, so because these people don't like, so in in it's not LGBTQ plus in Calgary, it's two S LGBTQIA plus. So I'm gonna try and remember that. It's the, it's not, this show is not just LGBTQ plus positive. We're also, don't know what it means, 2SL LGBTQ plus IA plus. Um, but here's what they said, that they're a community by fascists and bigots opposed to equal rights and treatment for all humans. And we are calling on everyone to attend and defend. So that's what's going on in Calgary, right? Uh, and thank you so much, uh, Bitcoin Graffiti, a palimpsest from Contact, writing again on something to reuse the paper or medium. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that. We are going to be talking about paper mediums today, though. So Bitcoin Graffiti, you have given us a excellent um, uh, simulation wink here. So the other one that I wanted to mention, and this had everyone upset, and and it, it'll we're going to add a punchline to it, but it's an important story, and and we're gonna we're gonna talk a bit about how we got here. But this is from the ACLU. So the ACLU says the state of Florida, they they first of all had uh, underlined that Dwayne Owen was executed in Florida, state execution, 
And ACLU writes, the state of Florida never provided medically necessary gender affirming care to Dwayne Owen, causing her enormous suffering, suffering and violating her right to be free and cruel, uh, be free from cruel and unusual punishment. For I can't read today for some reason. I don't know what's going on. Uh, to be free from cruel and unusual punishment for more than 30 years, she was in state custody. So uh, Twitter did actually put a community note on it and uh, because people were saying, you know, this is a travesty. So they came in and said that Dwayne stabbed a 14-year-old girl, girl, and I'm not even going to tell you what he did to her corpse. <laughs> it was not good. Um, and then murdered someone again a few years later. And so here, here's the thing, right? So this isn't, this isn't even a Moscow time headline. You know, I, I regret putting it near Moscow time because it needs some explanation. Um, now, what I see is the ACLU engaging in absolute pure propaganda. And when you see something like that, right? The reason you know it's propaganda is because I can't think of a single Democrat that I know. And I know a lot of Democrats. I know a lot of liberals. I know a lot of these people. I can't think of a single one <laughs> that would be for this person and their gender rights or whatever their stuff. This is a absolute criminal. And of course, people have pointed that out, right? The community knows pointed it out. Um, you know, people said, how can you possibly get upset with someone who is so heinous committing such terrible crimes and, and wondering about their gender identity and all of this stuff. And now when I say it's pure propaganda, what I want to um, underline here is that folks like the ACLU have been participating in this propaganda unchecked for a long time. And that's what's allowed on both sides of the political division algorithmic bubbles to really take shape, right? Because, you know, if it wasn't for the community notes, I think a lot of people, a lot of liberals, a lot of Democrats would have been angered and offended and would have had a great shot of dopamine and would have been self-righteous about this story. The community notes helpfully uh, stunted a bit of that uh, virality. The virality was just that they did it and it was mocking them. So that's, that's a, a big upgrade on where we would have been just a few months ago without something like community notes, because this would have been much more divisive. There was a ton of comment, uh, I think even from liberals saying, uh, <laughs> this is the wrong story to embrace ACLU. Um, now you can think what you want about capital punishment and you can think what you want about the gender stuff. Um, but here trying to get people angry about this one particular case to me looks exactly like um, folks who didn't know that the algorithmic bubble that we all live in is starting to be deflated and that there is starting to be some cross pollination and dialogue between the two bubbles. Of course, you know, we, we've talked about that many times, the fake prison of two ideas that sticks you into binaries and arguing things politically. You know, there's um, uh, a great uh, article today by Kate Oz. You know, we always like following her stuff. Um, Caitlin Oz, she is a uh, Australian writer, does some really amazing things, and um, you know is is able to put things in a in a simple to understand kind of frame. <clears throat> and this is what she has to say about it. So first of all, she wrote uh, a piece on her Substack yesterday called "Why Propaganda Works," and it's the sort of sub headline is "Human Psychology is Laden." with easily exploited cognitive biases, which the science of modern propaganda has learned to take advantage of with remarkable success. It's still very possible to resist its influence, right? So she talks a little bit about well, what we do here, right? That, that is really what this is all about getting together is to underline when propaganda is coming out, how to resist it, how to get over it, what are the problems with it, right? Um, so here's, here's what she goes on to say. It's pretty well established fact that free will doesn't exist nearly to the extent that most religions, philosophies, and judicial systems pretend it does. Our minds are very hackable and propaganda is very effective. If you don't get this, you don't understand the problem. So that's a bit of the stay humble argument in a sense, right? Bitcoiners, I think, understand that. And even when I'm talking about propaganda, I'll always tell you when I'm embracing my own narrative biases. It's really important to say that, right? Because 
even with, the, and we're going to be talking about the, the vaccine stuff in a few minutes, that's part of the problem, right? You see a story like, we love RFK, right? <laughs> he can do no wrong. Uh, and, and we're not even going against that, right? So um, we all have this narrative bias and we all tend to agree with things that agree with the narrative that we've already uh, accepted. So she goes in and says, do a deep dive into cognitive biases and how they operate. Look into the research, which shows our brains know what decisions we're going to make several seconds before the conscious mind makes uh, mind thinks we're making them. Uh, you're going to tell me these are organisms with free agency. In order to understand what we're up against, you have to understand psychological manipulation, how effective it is and why it works, because a mass scale psychological manipulation is the primary force preventing the public from turning against our rulers in our own interest. So, and you know, you can even start to understand that context, just go back into some of the stuff that Barack Obama said today, right? So so what I'm saying is the ACLU story is an example of that, right? I, I don't think any liberal that I know would be at all okay with what's actually going on in the story had they known the details, right? Now that Twitter came in and provided this context, many people were like, whoa, this is crazy, right? Um, but the same logic applies to uh, Obama just this weekend criticizing um, GOP hopefuls like Nikki Haley and Tim Scott for being a racist for being uh, racist now. So these people are now racist. And Vivek Ramaswamy, I think, punched Obama in the face with his reply pretty hard. But again, we have algorithmic bubbles, and no one's going to see it, right? So Vivek says Obama criticized GOP contenders Nikki Haley and Tim Scott for rejecting the left's myth of systemic racism. Sorry, Barack, we're not all prisoners of our skin color. Requiring minorities to adopt views about racism because of our own skin color is racism. So stop it. Um, so Vivek, I think, has it you know, pretty clear. But that wasn't the only thing Obama said this weekend. So he jumped into the race thing, right? These people are racist. But he also got into the misinformation uh, conversation within the same uh, um, uh, public uh, speech. And he said that uh, we need for digital fingerprints to be mandatory online to help authorities censor so-called misinformation, <laughs> right? So here's a guy who is clearly peddling in algorithmic bubble uh, speak. You know, I think Obama knows better. Uh, so you've got to wonder why he was saying that and at the same time going after um, this misinformation thing because... That came in the context of everything that's going on with Joe Rogan and RFK and Hotez, right? Hotez, this Hotez guy. So I remember watching the Hotez doctor on Joe Rogan, uh, it was probably a year or two ago. Thought he was pretty incredulous, frankly, already two years ago. Thought he came across as sort of a uh, the bumbling scientist, happy guy, you know, sort of scene that I saw. I didn't buy it, right, when he was on uh, Joe Rogan. I thought something was a little fishy with this guy. Now, I don't, it's narrative bias, right? So remember what, what Caitlin Oz said, that that's what I'm saying right now. I had narrative bias when I heard him, whatever, some years ago when he was on Joe Rogan. And, um, so what happened was RFK went on the Joe Rogan show and talked about the things he normally speaks about. And he does so very convincingly with absolute certainty in his mind that what he's talking about is true. But remember, RFK is a lawyer. And as someone who has been trained in those same arts, I can tell you that's what we learn. We learn how to speak confidently about something, even if we don't necessarily, because the skill of a lawyer is to persuade using language and to also manipulate, right? That's a big part of it. So don't um, believe that RFK isn't a manipulator. Of course he is. <laughs> of course he manipulates people. That's his skill set, right? His skill set is to manipulate. Now, I continue to say I don't detect any lying. He could be wrong about things, RFK. I just don't think he's lying, which is all I ask for, right? The only uh, weapon I use to fight against propaganda is look for lies, look for bullshit, look for people who are trying to slip one by you. And, and just seeing the signs of lying are enough for me to... 
um, make an opinion. And, and that's the best I can do, right? That that's sort of what I, what I have to navigate myself. Now, an amazing thing happened after, right? We've been talking just like we talked about the ACLU case about community notes, something that I've been trying to get going for a long time, right? And have wanted to see, um, um, out there, right, uh, in public and discussed and 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 all of these things, um, <clears throat> is um, you know the uh, with community notes working the way it did. One of the things I've been trying to do, and I've mentioned it many times. I'm not sure if I mentioned it here, but I've mentioned it when we're programming shows for Bitcoin Magazine, and we, you have this thing with a debate, right? And I've been talking for a long time about putting up a bounty for a debate. Right. Because that would be the best way to get people uh, in, you know, because it's hard in Bitcoin to get someone to be articulate about being a Bitcoin bear. Right. The people who don't like Bitcoin, which I want to have at the show just to work over the arguments, let's say, and hear them. Right. Not be in these algorithmic bubbles. Um, but it's very hard because they're afraid of the audience. There's no upside for them. What do they get? Right. So. I have been thinking for a long time that just given Bitcoin's nature, it would be very easy to set up bounties for or a prize pool, right? A fighter's prize um, and that you could have a debate and there would be a prize and that would get people who, uh, you know, might not want to risk too much uh, of their of their career collateral by just jumping into a debate around Bitcoin, but not really being that interested in it. And there's not really being any upside for the bears to come to our show because they know it's a hostile audience and they know all those things. So I thought a bounty, even if they lose the debate, uh, would be enough to get some of the the brighter people that you want. Not that the, I still haven't found the, a bright, a really bright Bitcoin critic. So it's not easy. I thought the money would help um, get the story out there. Uh, but so what happens is RFK goes on the show and I'm sure you've all heard, right? Um, the Peter Hotez doctor, who I just mentioned was on Joe Rogan before, jumped up and said, you know, wh why isn't Spotify uh, um, um, uh, censoring RFK? So he says, Spotify has stopped short of trying to stem Joe Rogan's vaccine misinformation. It's really true. Uh, and it's all, it's really true that it's awful, right? And from all the online attacks I'm receiving after this absurd podcast, it's clear many actually believe this nonsense, right? And so just as I said, the bounty was formed, right? So it started with Joe Rogan saying he'd give 100 grand, then Ackman said he'd give 100, and then Elon Musk got involved. I'm not sure if Elon said he was going to give money, but quickly the money went to like 1.5 million, and it's going up and up and up. So there's a huge pool of money there. And now it's caused a huge conversation around it. You get folks like Mark Cuban who have jumped in, right? And he criticized Joe Rogan saying, we can talk about generalities, Joe, not saying there aren't a lot of effed up things about pharma. And then he plugs his own <laughs> pharma thing, right? Um, but to ignore the industry and, and say all these things, right? Um, but he goes on to say that uh, it's not fair because the scientist doesn't have the podcast researchers <laughs> and the technical staff. Uh, so, you know, the question is, are you ready to defend your dissertation? And it's like, it's not fair. I don't have editors and podcast producer podcast producers working under me. Come on, guys. Um, so you had a whole bunch of people going on about, um, uh, is it a scientific debate? Well, not exactly, right? Because you are dealing with uh, someone like RFK, who is just simply more talented, right? He's just better at debating. And you're going to put him up against the scientist who's not so great at debating. Now, um, uh, I think Cernovich had the per perfect way of putting that actual debate, right? Where he says, um, um, you know, he went on 60 Minutes for a hostile debate. They had the editing power. Um, still edited, edited him and he's a regular guy just to discredit him. And that was about the, the Hillary Clinton health stuff, right? And he says, if you're in public life and want to enact laws forcing vaccines on people, yes, you do in fact have to show have the nuts to go on an unedited show to defend yourself, right? Now, Nate Silver said exactly what I'm saying, right? So Nate Silver came out and said, turning down a debate me challenge isn't the own that people think it is. Having rhetorical skills in an adversarial format before a large audience 
is a niche but fair a, a nice but fairly niche skill that doesn't really correlate with underlining accuracy or really even courage of one's convictions right and he says it's like sometimes i've been tempted to publicly challenge someone whom i'm in a statistical argument with at to a poker match and believe me i'd be thrilled to play and i'd have a big edge but i've also spent 10,000 hours playing poker it's not exactly a neutral playing field but cernovich had the right argument to that saying trial by combat allows for a substitute champion who should it be right and indeed it doesn't have to be hotez but who would anyone would go and debate um um rfk because i don't know if rfk is right right i have no idea if he's right uh i think he's right but i don't know and i'm never gonna know right as far as on my own research remember what we've said many times here the whole do your own research thing as an alternative to experts it's not a good look it doesn't work Right. I, I don't know shit about vaccines and I don't want to learn. I don't want to become an expert on any of this stuff. Right. I got other things on my mind. I'm interested in other things. I don't want to be an expert in everything that's critical to my life that I have to learn about, like vaccines. Right. I don't want to do that. Um, and that's why this debate and this new idea around these bounties for debate are such a great idea. We could not be in a better position than we are now because we can finally get over this algorithmic bubble thing. And I'm not saying an answer comes out of a debate. I'm not even saying the debate happens. But now that people are finally cluing in that a public debate is pretty much all we need to get around the algorithmic bubble, which is not designed to give you information, not designed for one side to beat the other, designed exactly for what we saw with Obama, designed to anger you, <laughs> to divide you, and to make sure that you're not seeing things at all on the same level and to just create new problems through which you can fight. So now it's not that the GOP um, isn't racist anymore. It's that the black people that joined are also racist. <laughs> So it's never going to end, right? Until you start getting out of the algorithmic bubble and don't allow for this stuff to happen because you've systematically changed how it operates, it's going to continue to be like this, right? And, you know, it, it's, it's for me personally, um, I do want to see a debate like this because, um, um, you know, the, these, uh, these, um, the context here, right, is that, um, um, like I'm sick of hearing also about the vaccine boogeyman. So that, that's what Cernovich says, right? I'm sick of hearing about the vaccine boogeyman being responsible for every ailment by people who don't even take their kids to the park to run or get sunshine and don't have family lifting sessions, right? So maybe that's part of the problem too. But he's not saying that, um, um, he's not saying that RFK is wrong about the vaccines being dangerous or not. He just wants to see some form of coherent, debate that would allow him to at least see who's lying, who's got the goods, right? Just like he says, these people, if they're going to go out and say, uh, get a vaccine, like everyone said, right? How many people said you have to get this vaccine? And, um, you know, Cernovich said exactly that, saying that um, if you're going to force everyone to take one of these vaccines, you got to have the ability to at least make the case, right? Especially if it's your own uh, research. And, um, you know, he goes on to say, look, th this is sort of part of the narrative bias. He says, I'm 45. We all went to school. Special education was a couple of kids. Now it's a huge department. My brother is a special education teacher, so I can confirm this, right? It, it used to be like five kids in my high school. It's, it's like two classes now. And the high school is smaller than it used to be. I do not believe vaccines cause autism, he says, but I'm so effing sick of the gaslighting. Something happened. What? I don't know. But no more lying, please. We all watch this happen in reality. And, you know, that that's, I think, what RFK has been saying for a long time. We've seen this trend. Things aren't very good. Uh, and we got to ask questions, right? Um, uh, Fisher King came out and said, this is tr about the actual uh, scientific debate and where we can get to. Um, he goes, this, it, it's, it's better than nothing, the debate. We litigate legal claims this way, which is far from perfect, but something comes out of it. People can tell when someone is lying, right? That, that's all we can do. That's it, right? Fisher King is saying in here, I, I, I will never have the skills to determine if Hotez, Dr. Hotez is correct, but correct and truth are not the same thing. They're not the same thing, right? I have a better ability to detect if someone's lying 
than if they're correct. And I don't know if RFK is correct, but I can confirm he's not lying. I don't know about Hotez. When I saw him on that one show, I saw slipperiness and uh, just a greasy guy who smiled too much while he was talking about really crazy things and didn't like the look of it. Now, I don't know. <laughs> it's just bias, right? Um, and, and that's what Fisher King says. He says, they can make credibility determinations. This is much better than having no debate at all. Um, you had our good friend, who we're big fans of, um, Eric Weinstein, jumped in and had some pretty interesting things to say about um, about all of this, right? So he comes in. Well, first of all, you know, we can just discount all the algorithmic bubble, uh, you know, low IQ sludge people from this debate. You know, Mehdi Hassan, pure sludge person, just a sludge person, right? He goes out and says, noted conspiracy theorist who has zero background in medicine and public health and said COVID would be gone by April 2020, thinks he knows more about vaccines than the world-renowned award-winning scientist who helped create patent-free COVID vaccines for the poor, right? And, you know, because, of course, um, um, Mehdi, Mehdi was talking about a few people here, but he takes aim particularly at uh, Elon Musk, right, who said who thinks Ho Hotez is afraid of a public debate because he knows he's wrong. Um, and, um, you know, everyone's sort of pointing out that, uh, you know, how, how bad it is for folks to be so hypocritical in whose advice they follow. You know, two minutes ago, it was uh, that person's not a doctor, but then everyone comes back and says, well, Bill Gates is not a doctor. <laughs> You get this whole, like, why do you do it that way? Why do you do it that way? Um, so Eric Weinstein came in with what I thought was a, a, a clever offer. And I think it just makes it actually, in the end, a perfect proposition, right? A perfect proposition. And that's Eric Weinstein himself offering to be sort of the arbiter of this debate, right? He says, may I give a different perspective, doctor? So he's trying to be civil to Dr. Hotez here. Many le Americans learned about how far off their concept of science was from COVID. They thought that science was something they could trust. They trusted their vaccines, their FDA, their CDC. And then they saw the COVID show and, and underline that, that um, um, the, the major issue in the end is that um, the public health uh, situation is so blinded by this propaganda. He says, almost all of us were left guessing. We knew we couldn't make informed decisions for our families because, because public health was taking away our ability to understand what was going on. They were lying and they were forcing their lies into our families, into our Wikipedia pages, into our bloodstream, into our lungs and across our blood brain barrier, into our diners, into our funerals, into our colleges and universities. And we want the lives gone. We want to know what has was done to us, our children, our shuttered businesses, our broken marriages. It's quite consequential. And we were abandoned by journalism, cut off from science, and blinded by public, by public health. There's no other way to say it. Here's what public health did. The disease threat was real, but seemed exaggerated, particularly for young, healthy people. The vaccine benefits were wildly exaggerated. Any interest in vaccine alternatives was ridiculed. Any attempt to find the origin was demonized as racism. And lastly, and most importantly, any concern about vaccine risks were made into a mental disease, right? That's what I saw, right? That, but it's a narrative bias, right? It's a narrative bias. And what you're seeing is not a gang up on you. It's not right wing. It's not neo-fascism. So Eric's speaking right now to Dr. Hotez. It's a revolution against modern state-directed mind control, right? So... Remember what Caitlin Oz said, right? It, it's about the division. You're not trying to win the debate. That, that's beyond the point, right? Dividing people is much more beneficial than winning a debate. If, if it was just a question of winning and everyone was trying to win, that would be a whole nother, um, um, uh, that would be in a whole nother story, right? So um, um, here's what Eric ends up offering, right? He says, so that is my offer to you. I know Robert Kennedy Jr. and Joe Rogan, and they are both men who change their minds when their arguments are tutored by new information. I will do any reasonable thing you ask to make sure it's a scientific exchange that isn't scored on debating technique, right? Because nobody wants gotcha. Nobody wants that, right? 
but you can't duck out claiming this is a gang up. I never said anything against you in my life, and I will be happy to work with you behind the scenes to make sure that science wins. Uh, what do you need to make sure science prevails uh, constructively, expert fact checking, etc. right? So um, he thanks the doctor and says, I hope this can work out. I hope we can do it together, right? So I don't think it's going to get done, um, but the the pieces are in place for something like this to finally happen. The bounty, I think now we can see that the way Balaji did the $1 million uh, bet for the bit signal, right, is catching on. Balaji um, um, picked up on this and he says, incredible, this is now a $1.5 million demand. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, um, demand for an open debate on this issue, right? So the $1.5 million that have been put up already are a demand for an open debate. And what he ends up saying about it is that his trick of putting a million dollars in is sort of caught on, right? That you can get a lot of attention on an issue just by putting money, which is what I've been saying internally at Bitcoin Magazine for a while. You would get one of these debates if you went and did that, right? Um, and I think that's the truth. Um, so, uh, we're left with, and now just let me give you one little bit of context on Dr. Peter Hotez, because, uh, this is the lying part. And I think it's important, right? We, we do have to. So I've said a few things to, to just let you know that I don't want to fall down and I don't want to lead you all down any, uh, cognitive bias or narrative bias around RFK. We love the guy. That's why we have the narrative bias, right? We love him. Uh, so um, here's what Dr. Hotez has been doing uh, for the last little while. Uh, he spent the last few years going on TV as an expert to disavow uh, and va vaccine skepticism and criticize Republicans and the lab leak theory, even though the NIH funded his research into the lab leak of the virus before COVID. In 2020, Dr. Hotez went on Joe. It was 2020. Jeez, it seems like a while ago, like sooner. Um, where he said uh, chloroquine was used in a small trial and worked well, although he later suggested not using it. He also used his platform to, and I don't believe hydroxychloroquine ever worked, right? I was, I was very bullish in the early days of the virus about it, but, you know, I think we would have found out. The, um, the other one, the ivermectin, I have a lot more uh, confidence in, but I'm still like a 50-50, right? If it works, who knows? Um, He's also used his platform to suggest the Department of Homeland Security and the DOJ investigate people who spread COVID misinformation and was an avid opponent to removing mask mandates from kids. What you probably didn't know, Hotez funded research at the Wuhan lab, don't know if that's true, uh, where they combined different COVID strands into one, even though he avidly fought against an investigation into the lab leak theory. He was also given a grant from the NIH in 2012 to research vaccines against SARS due to possible zoonotic reintroduction, reintroduction into humans. That's the animal thing. Accidental release from a laboratory or deliberate spreading of the virus through bio, bioterrorism. And I guess here's the last point about all of it. Uh, and we're going we're gonna, to um, put it in context in a second. So this is finally, you know, Cernovich is just doing the best work on this, by the way. Right. So I'm, I'm going to mention him again. And this is him again talking about the medicine, the medical profession and the need for a debate now on a bunch of issues, right? And, and, and to start getting away from the algorithmic bubble. And he says, medical errors kill 300,000 people a year. J&J &J put asbestos in talcum powder. Faisal used Nigerian children as lab rats. This was only 10 years ago. What is Vioxx? How many died from opioids given by doctors in big pharma? Knock off the goober bullshit, right? And it's true, like we, we need a conversation on all these things. But, um, 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 oh yeah, one more, one more comment from Leighton Woodhouse, uh, who we've been talking about a few times on this show. And this is the final sort of note on the debate. And then we're gonna talk about the context of it, right? About why this debate fixes the problem and, and, and where we're headed. So he says, after spending the duration of the pandemic vilifying COVID vaccine skeptics on Twitter, and dancing in scrubs on TikTok. Suddenly all these online doctors are like, no, science is not performance. It should be debated in peer reviewed journals, not over social media. <laughs> so very good, right? very, very good. Um, and, and Cernovich says, uh, we are supposed to pretend that all these guys don't jizz themselves to go on Maddow. No, they're scholars, publicity shy. They don't even know public speaking, right? So I think that, uh, 
is a great way to put it. Um, so uh, let's now, you know, bring this to another level as we like to do, right? Um, so here's what I learned this weekend. Um, here's what I learned. Uh, well, how, what order should I do this in? Hold on a second. Um, let me just see. Yeah. Okay. We'll do it like this. So, um, did you know, okay, now that's the way we're going to do it. Okay. Um, so do you guys know some, the reason this even came up for me today is because someone asked me, I was at the Bitcoin, uh, the Canadian Bitcoin conference this weekend. And somebody asked me, uh, you know, favorite books or whatever. Right. And I just said, you know, brave new world. I'm a, I'm a huge Aldous Huxley, brave new world fan like one of the top fans of that book, right? 1984 doesn't do it for me, right? It's like it's like for teenagers or something, right? The much more insidious and clever dystopia novel that is way more accurate in de describing the kind of uh, prison we find ourselves in came from Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. It's not even close, right? For me. Uh, but I didn't know, and, and talking about uh, Eric Weinstein, right? Uh, Eric Weinstein and his brother Brett, and it's a big academic family, and you know, and I, I, so I, I, I've sort of chatted with Eric many times. I interviewed Eric in 2019. I got him into Bitcoin, basically, as far as public speaking goes. I was the first person to ever interview Eric Weinstein. I did it. We, we him and I, still laugh about it, right? In that, uh, I tell him that we closed down uh, Broadway. I brought, uh, yeah, Broadway, right? We were the last like Broadway show before COVID because uh, we did our talk on Broadway as part of a consensus show. It was the last talk. We modeled the whole thing off of um, uh, Ter de Meester's uh, uh, Dutch Revolution paper that he had just written on Bitcoin uh, that year. So uh, we, we sort of mashed them together. It was great. We had a great time. And from there, you know, COVID hit. And then he started talking about gauge theory. And then the Bitcoiners jumped in. And then Alan Farrington wrote the thing. And then everyone reached out. And now he's like a big friend of the Bitcoiners, right? We love we love him, right? Uh, he did what the Hotez doctor is having trouble doing. He sort of went into the lines then, took the punches, uh, you know, showed hit the neuroplasticity that he was admiring in RFK and Joe Rogan, right? The ability to learn, right? Not a lot of people actually have that, right? So he has it. So um, just like the Weinsteins, I didn't know, but Aldous Huxley came from a similarly super talented family. And uh, so his father, Aldous Huxley's father, was pretty close with Darwin. Um, and his brother, Julian Huxley, started UNESCO, like the original UN, uh, he was the original director of that UN environmental, whatever the UNESCO stands for, right? And um, Huxley had a interesting encounter with uh, Théard de Chardin, who was a, a Jesuit writer working for the Vatican. And they were, so they, they had both written a book at one time called, uh, they both wrote, wrote separate books, but they were very similar. They overlapped in a sense. And those books were all about um, uh, the theory of a future evolution of man, where evolution was headed. And what they thought, what they wrote about, what they concluded was that um, uh, they, that, that, and they were both optimists, by the way, they were both optimistic. It wasn't dystopia that they were worried about, right? Uh, here's what they said. Um, he said, uh, Huxley and coming in with this, uh, Teilhard guy, they believed that there was a new plane of existence. So there's the physical world. There was the things we could see. Um, but there was a new, um, uh, plane of, a new battle plane that was being carved out that a lot of people understood and were aware of, but hardly anyone in mainstream society was aware of it. And they described it as kind of a envelope, a psychological envelope around the world. And it was called the new sphere, N-O-O -O sphere, right? And so Huxley said that it offered sort of an op op optimistic view of the future in which men and women progress in science, art, technology, and culture 
Teilhard gave his religious flavor to this uh, equally optimistic look. And the culmination of human's evolution, he said, was going to be a Christ consciousness, right? And that it was the omega point, which would unite evolved humanity with the word that was present at the beginning. Teilhard also posited that the emergence of a new realm on Earth, in addition to the, here it is, the lithosphere, the atmosphere, and the hydrosphere, and the biosphere, was going to be called the new sphere, right? The new sphere. Uh, the in interconnected realm of the human mind. Today, some people regard the global spread of the internet and information uh, technology as a validation of this concept, that there was this new sphere and that it was trending towards some form of consensus, right? That it would, would drive people into what Huxley believed, evolutionarily speaking, would be the simplest form of living, simple ideas, simple ways of understanding the world that it would tend towards a unanimity and consensus about obvious and simple things like the existence of God, like the existence of Christ and all of these other things. And, uh, but not only just the existence of them, their permanent presence in our world and our life and things like that. So, um, um, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because when you think of this envelope, right, when you think of this envelope descending around the world, and when people understood that, that its tendency was towards bringing people together, and if you saw that tendency and you were listening to these people and, and you were redesigning the world, let's say, right, um, as people did at the end of World War II, and you saw the preponderance and people like this talking about the natural inclination to come together, and if you saw that as a problem, the best way to avoid it would be to create two separate psychological envelopes that would not come into harmony because they, they were set on different trajectories, right? And the uh, Aldous Huxley, uh, sorry, the Julian Huxley story uh, about this uh, reminded me, reminded me, now I don't know if you guys know this, uh, but did you ever read, you know, everyone knows the story of Faust, right? A Faustian bargain, right? So Marlowe wrote a play on uh, Dr. Faust. The story of Dr. Faust is pretty simple, right? It's uh, he was the most talented person in the world scientifically. All the scientific skills you could ask for, one of the most successful people going, uh, but he still struggled to reach his epiphany, his moment of satisfaction. He still was unsatisfied, even though he was the most talented and an excellent human performer of everything at that time. So he ends up meeting a Miss Mephisto, Mephistophelius. Uh, I can't really pronounce the word right. And Mephisto is the devil, right? So that's where you get the deal with the devil, the bargain, the, the Faustian bargain with the devil. And because he starts invite, he starts practicing magic, right? He, he says, it's not going to work. The science thing's not going to work. I got to practice magic. Magic is the only way, right? Because he, he's found the limits of science. So magic is what is going to help him get there. And that's where he gets the deal, right? So the in the uh, Gotha version of the story, right, which some people say is the greatest version. Some people say it's the height of German uh, literature. In that story, um, an amazing thing happens, right? An amazing thing happens. Mephistophelius comes with Faust. And the first thing they do, is they go to Florence. Now, as Bitcoiners, we understand the significance of Florence, right? The Florin is one of the most uh, um, inspirational things around Bitcoin, right? We, we all understand, if you listen to Max and Stacy, they call El Salvador the new Florence. They call what's going on there, this burgeoning of human consciousness, of human success, of human optimism is the um, successor to what happened in Florence, right? And many people believe that the uh, amazing success that Florence knew was because of the money. We say the bookkeeping, but they also had the florin, which was the best gold coin in the world and was used as the most relevant financial reference point indicator uh, in the world, right? It was the most valuable currency in the world at that time. And there were all the Gresham's law as far as people hoarding it was true. People wanted that money more than any other money. And it was money, right? Now, if you go and read the Dr. Faust 
uh, story, the Gotha version, do you know what is going on? <laughs> the first thing he does? Well, he goes to help the emperor. And what does he do? He goes to the emperor and talks the emperor into uh, paper money. That's the story. That's the story of Faust. <laughs> he goes to the Florence Florentine emperor and convinces them with the help of Miss, the devil, <laughs> right? with the help of the devil, right? With the help of the demon, uh, Mephisto, they convince the emperor to get rid of the gold coin and to embrace paper money. And they call it that. It's called paper money, right? Money creation, paper money. And he even convinces, um, he even convinces the uh, emperor to put uh, a wizard, a magician, on the money itself. So the wizard and the magician go on the money. That's like the, the face, right? The heads. And it's the um, um, the uh, person is from the Bible, Simon the Sorcerer, right? So it's the person who tried to induce Peter uh, into magic. And, and so that person's on the money. And then, of course, the uh, emperor uh, takes a little while to understand what he's done, right? There's huge parties. Uh, this happens right before the carnival in Florence. It's the greatest carnival of all time. Mephisto says, we got to do more from now on, right? We have to do more of this partying. It's the best thing we could have done. Now that we can pay for it all with the paper money, we don't have to worry about the gold. Let's do a bigger party next year, right? Let's do a bigger party. And from then on, um, of course, the emperor realizes he can't control his, uh, his, his appetite to print money out of thin air anymore, right? So he's paying for all these parties. They want more. It won't end. It's just going to be more and more partying. And when you think about the history of money and you think about what happened uh, as far as a psychological envelope surrounding the world, um, everything was lost when Florence went to paper money. The psychological conditions around Florence, which was not global at the time, it was just Florence, degraded overnight. Overnight. By changing the money. The first, Imagine the first thing the demon wanted and gave for the corruption of this realm was paper money. The ability to conjure as if magic. Now, remember the whole, when I say Bitcoiners are alchemists, right? Um, which we talk about regularly here, that Bitcoiners are, it's a form of alchemy. There were two forms of alchemy, right? There was the physical alchemy of actually turning lead into gold with mercury as the uh, substrate, right? Um, but there was also the alchemy of the human body and of uh, purifying your own uh, blood and of actually conjuring gold with your own energetic system, right? Which is really just making gold by being good at stuff, right? It's like earning. And, and so th there was always this sort of um, dichotomy about how it's done, right? You can either have it as an inward compass to get better at stuff, or you can have it as a, an outward um, uh, sort of carrot, not carrot, it's the wrong word, uh, an outward a prod stick, right? I think a prod stick is a better way. A compass versus a prod stick was really the dichotomy we were seeing with, with the choice of the money, right? And so if you go from that point of view and you look at everything that's happened since uh, the paper money was instituted at scale in America, and, and, and then the psychological envelope surrounded the world, which we can call the internet, we can call it whatever you want, right? But this information layer, which we can't deny now in a sense, because you can sort of tell that the vibe of America or any of these places can indeed permeate the whole planet, right? We see it, we feel it, uh, we know there's something in the air right now, we can feel the energy changing and shifting. And you know, to bring it back to the debate, and to what's going on, um, the capacity for uh, the psychological manipulation of the two bubbles, which was primordial to make sure that this uh, corrupted money system could go forward, um, looks like it's breaking. Community Notes was a start. These public debates are pretty much all we need 
to help navigate ourselves. Because remember, the context of World War III, something we talk about all the time here, is that it's not necessarily a hot war like we're seeing in Ukraine and Russia. It is a psychological and economic war. And if you listen to what Huxley said here, that is the same thing. We are dealing with a psychological envelope around the world, which is the economy. We call the economy here all the time a psychological engine. Right? That, that's what it is. The economy is a psychological engine. And if you don't have a vision of what you're working for, of what the future looks like, you can't manifest it because you can't actually come up with the, the horsepower, the mental horsepower to produce it, right? You, 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 your, your, your psychological traction is off. You're just spinning without cogs, right? And these people that are sitting there saying, oh, uh, you have to listen to scientists, but also they're not a doctor and also uh, listen to Bill Gates. But what if he's not a doctor? Uh, we don't know the answer to that. that that's, what that's what thinking without traction means. That's what thinking without gears means, right? It just slips. And so Bitcoin is something that can help support the original idea of a psychological envelope around the world that is unitary in a sense, right? It can orient and reference the same things to everyone on the planet to allow them to have exactly what I was just mentioning, a inner compass to help guide you through your life. Now, ultimately, um, where this leads, right? Now, people say, um, now, now, e even think about the, the idea of dividing and why would you want to do that? Well, what are these countries made off of? The printed money and the political division of the fake prison of two ideas, having two parties and the semblance of some form of choice, right? Um, and that's sort of what we've been sold of, sold as democracy. Now, um, when I, when I think about that, when I, when I wonder what the future is, cause you know, that, that, that's why these UN people came around. They, they couldn't necessarily imagine a Bitcoin, right? So it was government and that they're going to coordinate because it is a massive work of coordination. They even predict it, right? That, that what they're talking about, um, is, is going to make the, um, uh, is so complicated, right? What 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 Huxley and and Tellard were talking about is so complicated and would require so much coordination that it was still a ways away. They were just perceiving the beginning elements of it. They imagined it was going to be some kind of uh, enlightened bureaucrat group around the world that were going to coordinate, like in some thing like the UN, right? Um, but that never worked out, right? Now, when I, because that still maintained the prod of a nation state, of a top-down structure. Now, when I think of anarcho-capitalism, for example, right, how would that work, right? People say, well, you're just like, what are we going to do? They're just going to kill people and there's no rule, there's no law. Well, here's where Bitcoin comes in, right? It's not just that Bitcoin is a reference, that it can be used as money and that it can help. Uh, it, it's, it's possible that the whole world can use it. It's not even so much that. It's the time preference thing again, right? The only way we're ever going to evolve is that if everyone respects everyone else's time, it has nothing to do with their opinions, nothing to do with their uh, the things they project into the world, if they're gay or any of these things, right? It is literally respect for people's time. And many people don't respect their own time, right? That, that That's sort of what money as fictitious paper robbing us of our time has led to that we we simply don't respect each other at all <laughs> like my time is way more valuable than whatever other stranger i meet's time right because we've been so led to understand this way of seeing things now when i think of a bunch of uh low time preference bitcoiners in the future just imagine what that sort of conflict can look like. It starts looking more like these debates that aren't all about dopamine delivery, that aren't all about um, getting to the end of the of the story. Because that, that's the most important thing about this debate that we're talking about with RFK and whoever does it, right? There's no timer. There's no running out the clock. There's none of that stuff. It's just let's try and search for the truth and see who's lying and, and, and see if people just disagree or if they're really lying. But the point is, if a bunch of people, if we get to a point and Bitcoin is able to become the psychological envelope that surrounds the world, 
the main reason, the main benefit is going to be a complete and lower time preference on the part of all human beings. And when that happens, you can actually start having people respect other people's property, right? Because that's their property. They spend time getting, no one's going to steal anything from anyone else. If we all actually have this uh, permeating psychological condition around the world that does lower our time preference, because it is in fact that there is no time in our money. The time is stolen. The money is inflated. None of it is a good benchmark. That's what's created this, uh, poverty of the spirit, poverty of the psychology, and fearful attitudes which have led to the thieving and the lack of respect and the complete degradation of normal public life in the public sphere. So that's how things have had some trouble, right? So let me read some of these comments. I see some people are a little hot. I didn't have time to get into all of it. Um, but let's see where we're at. So that's the presentation for today. Psychological envelopes, Bitcoin being the greatest psychological envelope uh, that the world can wrap itself in. And things should get better soon. You love doing Bitcoin first thing in the morning. We love it, man. We do Bitcoin. Morning, Justin. Hope you're doing well. Uh, introduce my business. No, I'm not that interested, Vera. Um, palimpsest from contact running again on something. Uh, I like Elon's. <laughs> uh, paper virus was scarce. Writings were wiped to write. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Contact from Carl Sagan. Thanks. Bitcoin graffiti. I was unaware of that. Reusing paper. Okay. Uh, can metaphorically layer like a pound, but digitally paper is the metaphor the web hasn't surpassed. Got it. I was watching old videos of World War II. Yeah, it's crazy. Eh? Even watching 9-11 stuff now is cringe. Cringe. Um, we've got free future money, but for communication, we're still tethered to Gutenberg. If free will shows up anywhere, it's in our use of language. Yeah, I think that's pretty accurate. Uh, v S Adams angry, maybe about, we'll see. We'll see if he says anything else. Uh, algorithmic bubbles is describing the symptoms. Hypertext is digital paper. Contra contrary wise conversations, digitally native hypertext can't avoid feedback. And so surrender too hard to vary assertions. Yeah. All presidents are puppets. Yeah. Until now. Yeah. Yeah. That's been the case. And the ones that weren't got killed, you know, the ones that weren't got killed. Um, I'm not sure if Trump was a puppet in, or was manipulated, right? I can see, I could see how to manipulate him. I can see it. Uh, but RFK, he does. Yeah, he does. Hello from Rwanda. Nice to see you, Pat Placid. Nice to see you from Rwanda. I heard Rwanda's doing great. I had a, a Rwandan roommate once. Um, Mark, <laughs> You got to hand it to, to Cuban about that. You, I kind of gave him a pass on that one. You know, why not have a conversation? Not any gotcha stuff, but people say, yeah, that, Johnny, that's what, uh, that's, I think what, what um, Eric Weinstein was offering, right? I, I don't think Hotez is going to take it, but that's what he's offering. Cause it, you know, that, that that's, that's your exact words, not a gotcha stuff. That's how I've tried to create every one of these Bitcoin debates over the years. And it's still not quite enough, but but that's the language. You know, no gotcha journalism is what I say. We're not going to do gotcha. Um, but what we need in, in Bitcoin anyway, it's exactly what happened. We want to see uh, a financial demand for debate. And then I think we'll get the right people because um, you don't, you know, you don't want people to get along on a debate anyway. Uh, doesn't debate feelings over facts. Left doesn't debate because feelings over facts. Johnny, everyone has feelings over facts. Uh, I wish. I wish it could be facts over feelings, but even, you know, that, that's why I try to mention here all the time, we are all susceptible to it. We, we can't just imagine that we're not the ones. Magically, we're not the ones. It's us that only does facts. It's not true, right? It's just not true. We are susceptible, and that's what Caitlin Oz is saying, as susceptible to being manipulated as anyone. Look at Trump feeling over facts. I'll mind read Trump for a, a bit, but 
I've always thought Trump wants the admiration of some of these people, right? And that and that's maybe how he was manipulated. I don't I don't think it's because of money or anything like that. I think he just wanted, like any human, people to like him. Uh, come on, fellow humans, hit the like button. We love it. V, thank you. Uh, are they going to come up and say that they were trying to kill us so they can get paid? Yeah, no, they're not. They're not going to say that. <laughs> Which is why you're not really necessarily going to get a good debate. Uh, but but that it's out there, to me, look, if, if no one shows up, we just keep going with RFK's talking points. If no one can debunk him, it seems easy to debunk. If they, they're all saying he's so stupid, seems easy. Do it. Let's go. I want to see it. If you don't see it, I'm sticking with RFK, <laughs> right? Like, if I don't see the debate and no one bothers showing up and they just go, oh, he's a... Remember what I always said, the, the best thing about him and the word conspiracy theorist is because of his family history. You know, if your dad was killed and your dad's killer was killed and your uncle was killed, your uncle's killer was killed, killed, your uncle's killer's killer was killed, you're allowed to ask questions. You're the only one in the world who doesn't, who can't be called a conspiracy theorist. He's the only one who can't be called a conspiracy theorist. It doesn't matter what else he says. So it's amazing. Remember my prediction about him being president back in November had not, I didn't know anything about him. He had not said a thing on Bitcoin. It was simply that. It was that the conspiracy theorist label wouldn't work and the appetite for cognitive closure on the JFK story is so great and it so implicates Bitcoin, the Secret Service, um, NSA, all of these people that, that that's where it's headed. I, I, I could make no other conclusion besides Elon's razor saying that the most entertaining outcome, which is bringing all this 1963-64 stuff to light, was where we were headed. And RFK happened to just be at the nexus of this. He is the, let's call it shatter point, of all of these stories. All of them, right? You know, the, here's here's a, a, a miss, I think, from Cernovich, where Cernovich comes out and says, you know, uh, what the hell was RFK doing all these years anyway, right? When Trump was president, was he out there just being like a orange man bad? Why didn't he defend Trump? And, and you know, remember, uh, Cernovich was the first critic of Trump, right? He's the original Trump critic. Um, but, but here he goes out and says, you know, what was he doing all those years, right? And Benjamin Braddock goes out and says, during the Trump years, he built Children's Health Defense into a powerful advocacy org at both national and state levels, as well as opening chapters in Europe, Australia, Ireland, Canada, Africa, filed numerous lawsuits at aimed at forcing federal agencies to follow the law and their own regulatory standards, wrote and published the best-selling book of 2020, which was the Dr. Fauci book, established himself as a leading opponent of vaccine mandates and... Um, uh, uh, he was supposed to lead a, a vaccine safety commission promised by Trump, but it never materialized. So he did try to work with Trump, right? Um, so look, if they don't debate, I'm just sticking with this guy. <laughs> he, he's done enough, right? And at least he makes sense. And it, he's telling the truth as far as I know. He could be wrong. I don't give a shit if he's wrong. If he's wrong, we'll find out if there's a debate. Uh, so, so that's what's going on with him. Uh, I always think credibility who looks at politicians versus bitcoiners and thinks i'm going to side with them and they just seem more open and honest and confident that's a that's a perfect way of putting it utxo um we all agree that covid19 was a strong flu especially for oldie older and unhealthy obese completely exaggerated and mind controlling propaganda um i'm not sure if the original covid strain wasn't dangerous um and i'm not sure if it wasn't dangerous towards certain races because if you if you look at what now it's propaganda but the chinese and russians have been consistently saying that the u.s is creating genetic specific specifically targeted viruses for genetics which wouldn't affect america because america has a you know diversity is our strength right um, Russia is, of course, a, a homogenous population, and so is China. So um, uh, what I saw being in New York for COVID was a lot of dead bodies. Now, it's a big city and people die all the time, right? Because I never really bothered with the lockdowns. I'd already had COVID in January and wasn't really living in a state of fear. I continued to walk around New York City and be a normal person. Uh, I, I did the whole like walk around the empty apocalyptic <laughs> New York all the time, every day. 
Um, but I saw a lot of body bags. I mean, a lot. Like I saw a lot of people coming out of buildings. So, uh, you know, I won't say the early strain was zero. Uh, and I do agree because I'd already had it. I, I wasn't worried it was going to kill me. Uh, and the propaganda was everybody has to stay home, you know, because I was ready to go get anything for the, the fat people or the old people. I would have done anything for them for it to not be a general lockdown, right? I, I was volunteering. Anyone who needs groceries, I'll get them for you. Stay home for two years if you need to, right? Just don't make me get locked up. Um, so there you go. So, you know, we, we agree that it be, the thing was run as propaganda, um, but I do think the original strain had dangers only because I saw the bodies. I have no, no proof at all. If it comes out the whole thing was a scam, then, uh, you know, I stand corrected. Uh, people die. I mean, I could, I could still see a scenario where it's not true, right? Like, how many people die normally in New York City? A lot. <laughs> it's a big city, right? Uh, and if you don't see anything else but the body bag moving, which is what I would see, like, you know, I went to the, I even went to the the cemeteries because no one would stress you. And the cemeteries are beautiful in New York City. And they had the cherry blossoms everywhere and the raid right in town. And no one would stress you because you'd, you, sometimes you'd get stressed, you know, people would come and give you shit for being out and, and all that stuff. And you just didn't want to deal you're with kids. You don't want, I didn't want to show them the fights even, right? Like I was trying to keep them away from all of it. So we would go to the cemeteries and boy, one day I had to leave because they had that old crematorium fired up and it, <laughs> I saw it. It was, it was like traffic jam, man, traffic jam. And um, it was pretty bleak. It's pretty dark stuff. I did not, I had left that cemetery. The smell, smell. Occupy Wall Street was the moment the deep state pulled the ripcord on divisive Ida. You're 100% correct, t Dog Yo-Yo. That is one of the, the more astute observations. Um, that's why I started this one with what Obama said this weekend, right? Um, you know, at one time he's asking for more spying and, and against the misinformation, uh, but he's out there telling everyone what a racist place America is and and that actually the Republicans are even more racist now because they have black people running for them because they're racist. So there you go. Uh, I strongly agree with those previous comments about COVID and the young and healthy people. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what you need to make sure science prevails is indelible publishing, which can't avoid feedback. And in the feedback uh, on the feedback, structure complexity and inter interrelation of issues and highlights signal yeah i think but that's a time preference thing right that that's it it's it's the it's the um time it takes to do the stuff right is not commercially viable right what is this live about psychological engines that perpetu uh, perpetuate the future Psychological engines that perpetuate the future, Highness 50. Uh, we can all keep debating and the jab, uh, but whatever happened today, the flu is gone. Yeah, I know. But that's possible. You know, I will even say that's possible. It's possible for uh, one thing to, to hijack, right? Uh, and, and by the way, all the flu deaths, they were always fake. That was never true. 50,000 people die of the flu every year. Fake news. Not true. They were just scientific, uh, you know, people who can't explain shit. Uh, I was just at a neighbor's last night and all the people were on the left and feel the vaccines are effective and the war in Ukraine is necessary to stop. Right yeah, Nicholas, I know. I've, it's pretty bad. Um, you need new neighbors. <laughs> yeah, I went out with some old friends the other day and even they were like, uh, you know, RFKs of uh Conspiracy theorists and <laughs> what? You know. Uh, still, people have to go to the way to look at a Bitcoiner, put them side by side, and that's another story. Yeah. Uh, I know a dude with lupus on hydroxychloroquine, overweight, diabetic, unhealthy, late 50s. His whole immediate family had COVID. He didn't catch it. Yeah. I mean, you're always going to find those anecdotes. Always, always, always. Right. It's um, that's why it's hard to, to verify. Um, It's called the Matrix, indeed. 
Um, Thomas Henry Huxley, Darwin's bulldog. Meanwhile, Bitcoin is a bootstrapping feature of the new sphere. Yes, yes, yeah. It's a coordinating effect of the um, new sphere. And he was indeed, the father was indeed Darwin's bulldog. Um, that's what I've seen. Because uh, I, I only learned about the family, sort of rest of them for a while. Uh, it solves the contradiction broadcast mediums leave us with lack of structuring feedback that Peter Singer pointed out in Famine, Affluence, and Morality. Thanks, Jeremy. I didn't know that. Um, one of my favorite Dr. Fesses. Yeah, but not the Christopher Milo one. Yeah, I, I was talking about the goat. Goat. Right. Long time no see live. Well, we love it, Gold 106. We are fans. Um... It's a shame that the meaning of adoption for you is to wreck many people as Bitcoin is rigged. I don't understand what you're talking about. It's a shame that the meaning of adoption for you is to wreck many people. All right, I guess. Kavoth. Maybe I'm wrecking people, I guess. Fast like Melkor in Tolkien. The analogy is homogolous. Uh, in Goth, Sorcerer's Apprentice as well. Yeah. Yeah, isn't it amazing? The paper freaking, the simulation is, isn't that hilarious? That the story is literally that. It's paper money. Um, and uh, imagine if you were in conversation with the devil and his plan was to do that. <laughs> and they destroyed the florin. In the story, they destroy the florin. Crazy. Uh, it's been fascinating. I'll be reading more about this. Great way to start the week. Thanks, Von Ray. Uh, compass versus prostrate analogy with the right and left hemisphere, uh, per Ian McGillichrist. I didn't, Jeremy, you are full of good, uh, information today. Two ways of attending one brain. Yeah. You need the compass in your psychological engine. You sure do. You sure do. Yeah. You sure do. Um, fiat alone can't go. No. That's how you get stuck in the fake prison. I think Jefferson, before Washington was inaugurated, when he stated he would prefer a country with newspapers and no government. <laughs> well, the newspapers became worse, unfortunately. Um, though his language was though uh, that those papers should penetrate the whole mass of the people. Kind of truce, yeah. My envelope just dissolved. Uh, Uh, Bitcoin is a check in respecting time when you're vulnerable to feedback, a good faith forwarding of a conversation, and you don't forfeit your time, so to speak, in the lightning channel of hypertext. Yeah, that, that's it right there, Jeremy. That's that's the argument. Um, J RFK Jr.'s comment about fingerprint tech. I didn't see that, V.S. Adams. I didn't see it. Um, I would like to see it, but I have not. I'm behind in this video, but I'm 41. And when I was in school, there were multiple special ed classes in your school. Yeah, I mean, so I guess it's a little difficult for me to say because my where I'm from in Quebec is super philanthropical. And we had like a whole, um, we were, like a lot of orphan, you know, the ones that were not taken by their families. We sort of had a like a place for them. In fact, one of the best men at my wedding was one of those handicapped people. I had uh, three best men, and he was one. So, uh, and there were sort of just different pe parts of my life, you know. My wife had three maids of honor, you know, just that that whole thing at the wedding. Um, I mean, thanks, Jeremy. Well, amazing comments today, man. Um, poverty of the spirit, yeah. Uh, he's the only one in the world. It, that's what I believe. He's literally the only person it, it can't work on, <laughs> right? Now, I know it's like it's worked, but people have been saying it. But in the end, you can, you can actually get people off that ledge pretty easily that he's a conspiracy theorist. I've been successful doing it without much, without much effort. It's just that line alone sort of blunts the conspiracy theorist line. If anyone tells you, oh, he's a conspiracy theorist. You just repeat that. Oh, okay, well, you know, remember his dad was killed. His dad's killer was killed. His uncle was killed. His uncle's killer was killed. His uncle's killer's killer was killed. I think he can ask questions, right? <laughs> He's got some rights. Uh, 
Thanks a lot, bud. All right, team. Thanks for coming, everyone. Where do I sat? Good morning, everyone. Bonjour à tous. Uh, I will see you all tomorrow. I'll be around. Have a great day. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it.